I think so. I think so. Good morning, everybody. It's time for the next session. This one is going to be uh, new developments in rocket electronics. Our <coughs> guest speaker is John Beans. He's the founder of Jolly Logic. Uh, his love of flying things and product design led him to start his own company to make fun and easy to use electronics such as altimeter one and altimeter two. I saw a talk similar to this at Narcon last year. It was one of the best attended and most interesting talks. So uh, I asked John to come all the way from California to present. So please join me in welcoming John Bean. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. Um, just a quick, a little quick survey here. Um, how many people heard my talk last year? in California. Anybody? One? Uh, was it any good? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> it was the best. It was the best talk in our country. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, did anybody see it online afterwards, the replay? Okay, cool. So it's new. So if I say old stuff, you're not going to know, right? It's, it's all new stuff. Uh, how many of you uh, almost only fly L3 type stuff? How many of you fly uh, rockets with uh, C's, D's, E's, F's, G's, those kinds of things. Okay, good. Okay, good. Um, what about in the middle? You said L3. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, I'll talk about L when, when I get my L2, which I'm going to do here pretty soon, then we'll talk L2. Right now, it's, you know. Uh, I do have my L1, yeah. Um, good. So this will apply to everybody. Um, uh, one of the things I like to do kind of when I start off is to just give you a little introduction about where I kind of come from because whenever anybody gives you a talk you want to know what their biases are just so you can kind of calibrate. Um, I have engineering degrees from Clemson and Berkeley. Uh, I spent most of my career at high-tech startups in Silicon Valley running product marketing. So a product marketing person tries to figure out what product to make. Um, it tries to work with, with the development team to try to create the best product that they can. Um, but I'm kind of a blend when it comes to engineering between kind of mechanical and electrical and computer. I like all of those things. Um, and that's increasingly important now when computing kind of finds its way into everything. Um, Steve Jurvetson, who's a member of our uh, Lunar Club in Livermore, California, is also a venture capitalist. And one of his kind of core elements of his presentations that he gives at places like SpaceX and all kinds of TED conferences and things like that is the, is the influence that computing has had on lots of fields, whether it's medicine or, or rocketry or, or, or anything. It's, it's infused our lives. The ability to design things on computers and to put computing into everyday uh, objects is, a, is, a, is a, massive, a massive trend. But my focus, like where I kind of come from, is I like to make things easy to use. So I have this bias that uh, technology, unless it's harnessed correctly, can be very frustrating that if you really do the design work and if you really understand people that you can make something if you really work hard that appears simple. But the easiest thing to create is something that's just hard to use. Just kind of put it out there and see what people do with it. So that's just kind of my, if you want to figure out how I'm wired, I think about ease of use all the time and I work really, really hard at it. And, and, and this is kind of how I look at, at, at solving problems. So focus on what's the problem that you're trying to solve. Not, here's a technology, how can I use it? Um, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Um, there's an awful lot of cool things out there that you want to get your hands on. You wonder, I don't know what I'll do with that, but that would be really cool to have. Um, and also, you know, examine your assumptions. So sometimes if you're having a problem, one of the things I like to do is try to figure out what, what am I assuming here that led me, that led me to this problem? to try to get to a more satisfying solution. And some of this, I'm being a little vague right now, but this will all make sense in, in a little bit, I hope. And then look at fusion. There are some problems where until you solve two problems, you couldn't really solve either one. Or un until you took two pieces of technology together, you didn't really come up with something satisfying. And one example I like to give for this is GPS in your car. Before it was ever hooked to your tachometer, you'd go into a tunnel and the thing would just blink off. And so if you're in a place like Boston, which has just tunnels all over the place, you know, right when you leave the airport, right when you need navigation the most, it just says, I, I can't see a satellite, I can't work. 
but now they just kind of keep moving. Even if you lose GPS, they'll try to keep up with where you're going and, and do dead reckoning even when they lose their satellite. So sometimes when you put, solve more than one problem at once, suddenly the whole thing becomes more satisfying. So just, just a, a, a little more background here. Some ways to use electronics and rocketry. This is one way to think about it. Well, you can use it to design and build it, like with RockSim, right? You can use a computer to do that. You can use it when you're flying, okay, to actually deploy, uh, to do a secondary deployment. You know, we don't do guidance, right, in, in hobby rocketry. You can kind of imagine that, but we don't do that. Um, collecting data for, for research, uh, for contests. Actually, you might correct you on guidance. Depending upon the application, uh, autopilots, stability, and augmentation, and the like, there's no issues at all associated with guidance. Right, right, right. There, there are some things we could do, right? So on the forums, we talk a lot about maybe I can keep it a little straighter and that kind of thing. We're not going to try to slide into the side of a bunker or anything, but right, we could do. We stability is usually a better word that I like. <laughs> Actually, return guidance might not be a bad idea either. There we go. That's true. Once, you, once it's deployed. Yeah, I've always been I've always been fascinated by that. The idea that I could bring a rocket back to the pad. I think that would be there is, I've, pretty cool. I've got some guidance on that from a uh, safety standpoint of some guidelines for acceptable guidance and unacceptable guidance. Okay, good. So all those products you guys are cooking up, those are now legal. <laughs> uh, and then and then the other thing we use electronics for is finding your rocket, right? That's a, that's that's another that's another way to use it. But but let's turn this around a little bit and let's just make a list of what the problems you have. Those are all the things you could use electronics for. But let's turn it around and say, what are, what are the problems that you want to try to solve? Here's my list, OK? This is my list, personally. You have, may have others, right? This is my list. One is pad delay. So I set everything up, and I've got everything working correctly. And then they go to the small pad. And I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I'm waiting. And after a while, I'm just, I almost want to talk to the LCO. Can we this is not going to work unless we launch it right now, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering, is it going to work? Uh, the other thing is you know, deploying. Right, you see it go up, and then you know it should have happened by now, and it still hasn't, and it still hasn't. That's another problem I worry about when I'm flying. Another is zippering, so it comes out really early. The, the first uh, expensive rocket my uh, older son got was uh, an Aerotech Mustang, which is, which is a pretty narrow rocket for, for the engines that it has. It, it, those move, and we grossly miscalculated the delay on its first flight, and zipped it all the way down to the bulkhead. There wasn't even enough really for a stub, you know, just all the way down. Um, another is rockets that land hard and break. Um, I have a real weakness for swept fin designs. I just, they stand up on the floor, right? They look really cool, but that's also their landing gear, right? Uh, so, you know, uh, that's one of my problems. Uh, rockets that drift away. Right? We've all had that flight where it just goes like this, and you just, the first thing you think is, I'm not getting that back. You know, you know. Uh, another is no idea how my rocket really performed. You know, the first flights I went out with my kids, they would say, how high did that go? And I would say, well, you know, the, the, the bag said 500 feet, and it's way up there. I'm going to say 500 feet. And then we'd fly another rocket, and my, my son would say, how high did that go? And I would say, that looks like about 500 feet. My other son would say, the bag said 1,200. I said, but it's 1,200. That's 1,200 feet. <laughs> and that's, that's really where, where Jolly Logic came from. I decided to make products that would let my kids know those things, because we had some interesting conversations about what, makes, what, make, what would make a rocket go higher or not. Um, and I wanted to have the data. So I'm just one of those guys that like, wants to know the data. Like That's the truth to me, is the data. right? So those are the problems, and you can kind of roughly group them, right? So I'd call this first thing kind of monitoring. I'd call these things in the middle here deployment, roughly. Uh, although the last thing we could also call that tracking. That could be two things, right? Because you know, if you if you deployed differently, maybe it wouldn't drift as far, and we wouldn't have to track it, right? But once it does, maybe we call that tracking. And then sensors. You know, I would say how how it performs. What kind of sensors can we get into our rocket to get us data to let us know kind of what happened. Now, there's the, here's the most significant trend in, in rocketry at launches lately. In the last few years, the amount of wireless electronics at the launch pad has skyrocketed. Have you noticed? 
Uh, it's just not being used for rocketry. It's in our pockets. Okay, let's do a, a quick survey. Uh, who here um, does not have a smartphone? Okay, that's about, I'll uh, say a quarter. Okay, how many people here have an Apple smartphone? Okay, how many people here have an Android smartphone? Okay, so the Apple and the Android is about even, so I would put it at, I don't know, was there much of it? Let, 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 let's say that, let, let's go 40, 40, 20. Okay, so 40 Apple, 40 uh, Android, 20 not smartphone. How about Microsoft smartphone? Uh, how many people ha carry a Microsoft smartphone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you work for Microsoft? Yeah. Okay. I'm taking note of that. Okay, well. Um, we no 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 we we do include that we usually call it other, <laughs> but it is it is in the data it is in the data. Okay, so not yet we don't use these yet, and that that's one thing I think that we need to change because we we spend a lot of money for these and they have an awesome amount of computing in them, and it can be really useful for rocketry. Okay, we 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 should use. I mean they have they have good user interfaces and they have lots of built-in stuff, right? They have cameras, they have, they have three kinds of networking. Um, Android phones have four. Uh, GPS, access to maps, they can share stuff. Um, have any of you, or any of you like me, that you've noticed that you'd much rather take a picture with your phone than your camera, just because how easy it is to send it to someone? It's a sharing element, right? You wouldn't think, you'd think, what a crappy camera. It is a crappy camera. What a crappy camera. Uh, uh, although Lumia has some nice cameras on, that's a Windows phone. Uh, uh, but crappy camera, but it was those other things, the fusion, it was, it was the ability to have it networked and shareable that suddenly made it the best camera, even though it's taken pictures we took eight years ago, right? You know, we're down to the megapixel again, right? So, so it's that fusion that, that suddenly makes it like really convenient and, 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 and usable and access to storage in the cloud. The fact that you know, you, that picture I can dash off to my family or post it on Facebook or do whatever. There are cameras now that kind of do that too, but, but just that, that simple convenience is important. Okay? The uh, Bluetooth may be one of the first ways that we take advantage of this in rocketry because these modules you know, are teeny um, and they've gotten really inexpensive. I did this talk last year and the figure I had up here was I think twice this, 14 or 15 dollars. And it's dropped that much. So a product designer that makes rocket, rocketry, uh, electronics for rocketry now has a much smaller barrier and it's a teeny little module and they're pretty low power. Okay, and just from the intricacies of what it takes to develop a product that works with Android and works with Apple, Bluetooth uh, can, can actually be a lot easier than using a cabled solution, which is parts wise cheaper because less different kinds of connectors um, and uh, the security requirements especially at Apple are actually lower on Bluetooth than they are on a cabled solution. Apple gets really particular when you start to connect something to them, what you're doing, how much power you're drawing, uh, you know, everything. They really care about the cable then. So I'm going to talk to you about a product, the Altimeter 3, that was actually designed to be cabled to smartphones and switched to Bluetooth, which kind of set its development back, but ended up being, I think, a good thing. Okay, so I want to show you a real uh, product example of this. Um, this is the first time anybody's seen Altimeter 3, which is coming out this year, um, and I want to give you kind of, a, a kind of a live demo of it. So let me pass these around, take a look at this. This is Altimeter 3. If you guys would click those on. Okay. Okay, so those, those are both turned on, correct? 
Okay. Um, both of those are waiting for to be connected to uh, a mobile phone, and that this that's actually the screen of my mobile phone that, that that's up on the screen. Yeah, it's, searching. it's searching, right? They're both looking for something to connect to. So let's go ahead and launch the Altimeter Three app. <coughs> okay. So this is the Altimeter Three app. This is a little bit of a stripped down version. When you're doing a live demo, you don't really want anything. <laughs> if you had any features you were just about done with, you you know, take them out, take them out. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna press to connect. And it's gonna look and it's gonna try to find these, these two. It should see both of them if they're both on. Who's got 4AF7? That's this one. That's this one? It's closer. It should be able to reach them throughout the room. I'd like to see both of them. Let's see. I, I think I've, they're both paired. What's the maximum range? You know, it really depends. So I've been at the launch pad, and I've stepped back all the way to the LCO before. Uh, and, I've, and I've had sometimes when it was on the back side of the rocket, and I was testing a bunch of other things, where it would really get down to about 30 feet. So it, it, at, at that point, it starts to depend on orientation and what's between it and things like that. But I've had some times when I was way back and still still monitoring. And I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, my, for some reason my mirroring stopped here. Let's see. Not nearly as impressive if you can't see it happen. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, that's why. Not fine. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't know why my laptop decided not to be on the net there for a second. Okay, so there we go. So who's got, let's do 4AF7 since it was being less cranky. Somewhere back, 4AF7, someone's got it. I'm going to connect to it. Is anybody here from California? Hey, Ray. Okay, so I have a quiz for you guys. There's going to be two quizzes in this for people from California. Not that it's like an inside thing, but they're in trouble if they don't know a couple things here. So, Okay, so here we go. Okay, so now what you see is all of a sudden, now we've got controls to this. Oh. Did someone click the button? No click, no turning off the altimeter. Okay. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to move to 4B29. We're going to connect to that one. Okay, so now, now we're connected. Uh, this, this mirroring thing, which is the hardest thing we're doing right now, is being a little bit cranky. But, but basically, you see the controls here. Who's got, who's got 4B29 in their hand? Okay, Matt, when I click this, you tell me what you see. So I'm going to click record. Okay, so this is live. So this is sending a packet every second. So when you're at the launch pad and you see that timer moving, you know that you've got power and you can see the battery charge. So this is 90, it says 98%, right Matt? Yep. So it's 98%. So this is all live data that's kind of going back and forth. If you get out of range, and of course you will once this takes off, uh, you'll see this disconnect, but it's still recording. And when you come back in, you'll reconnect. You'll see the timer moving again. You know, it'll say four or five minutes. And, and then when you're done, you say, you say, stop recording. So what is your range on the ground? 
anywhere from, it's always at least like this room. You could be at the back of the room. Sometimes in open air, on a pad, facing the right way, it can be, I don't know, 100 feet, 120 feet. It is Bluetooth, yes. Okay, now let's, let's take a look at, at kind of what we've got here. Um, and then here comes the first quiz, California people, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up a flight here. So here's a, here's a flight, okay. This is a flight to, let me, let me kind of, I'm gonna pinch and zoom here and zoom in. This is a flight to, I think this is the peak right here. That is about 698 feet, right? That's a flight, let's see, let me try to guess what engine that was. So let's look at the, let's look at the engine data here. This is about a two second burn. Uh, and I know what the rocket was. So this is a G engine. This is, a, this is a, one of those single use G40s, let's say. It took my rocket up to about 600 and, and, and what was it, 98 feet? Yeah. Let's zoom in here. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this to him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna select this Apogee here, and I'm going to share it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little snapshot of this, and I want the data. Okay, so I want to play with it later. I'm doing a project. Uh, this, is, this is my son doing a science project on, you know, fins and things. It's going to use my email. I'm going to say, you know, let's see what I'll say, 698 feet. Okay, and then I'll hit send. Now let's come over and look. I, I send this to myself. Let's jump over here. We're online. Oh, hey, Ryan, thanks. Uh, there we go. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So here is that, this is the flight graph, and that's, remember when I zoomed in on the Apogee yeah. and selected it, and then down here, I don't know if you can see it, let's go down, oh, here we go. This flight report, let's open up this flight report in Excel. Okay, so here's flight one, enable editing. Here's flight one, uh, time and date. Move this down a little bit. Okay, uh, here is the data from the flight. So you've got it here, you can, you can kind of mess with it. Uh, okay, Ryan, uh, what is this? Not that you'd know, but bonus points if you do. That's latitude and longitude. So here's one of the cool things, since this was hooked to my smartphone and my smartphone has GPS, every flight gets tagged with my location. It looks like that was in California. Okay, it's in California, 20 feet elevation. Does that ring a bell? San okay, check this out. I'm going to click on this map. We're going to see what it comes up with. This is all stamped automatically. I didn't do anything to do any of this, right? The product does this. There we go. So that's Moffett's Air Force Base. That's, that's, that's the elevation at Moffett. So this was a flight to 690 feet at Moffett on one of our lunar launches that we do uh, every month. Um, and this is, so this is the kind of information I've kind of got in my flight. So you're starting to see now where you've got this little device which is only so capable, but it does have a link, and it's got a link to this thing, and this thing's got a link to the world. Um, where did the 20 feet elevation come from? Does anybody know? Anyone want to guess? Yeah, there's APIs on the web. So it actually went on the web. I think I used Google's. Google's is a mashup of uh, US Geological Survey and other sources, and it looked it up. It said, here's this, here's this GPS coordinate. What's the ground elevation? A pressure sensor is so uh, weather dependent that, it, that at Moffett, I've seen negative 150 feet, right? So you're launching at negative 150 feet. So one of the first times that I beta tested this, I wasn't ready for negative numbers and I kind of had a little problem. <laughs> I'm like, when would you ever, you know, when would you ever launch at negative 150 feet? Well, on a low pressure day, you could. If you look up the, if you look up the barometric pressure, why can't you just enter it so it knows where, it, where it's at? No, it's on a hot day, it would be, you know, just like your, you know, 
what yeah. I'm saying is you go on to the, the local airport, right. say, say there you go to SFO, right. and you listen to their ATIS, and it says local altimeter is 2985. So you'd be able to enter 2985, right. and now your altimeter is calibrated. And pressure corrected, yeah. It, but we, we can do that automatically too, right? Because if you, if you know the elevation that you're located, you can backtrack to what the, sea, the adjusted sea level is, and you can, you can pressure correct, not temperature correct, but pressure correct your flights. So yes, you can. So you just add 122 to everything. Right. It started at minus 122. Right. Yeah, exactly. I have a raised hand question on the altitude. Yes. If you're not able to pull it off the GPS chipset in the cell phone? The, it will show ground level. Yeah. Right? Because then you wouldn't lift it up from the coordinate. Doesn't it tell you what it's Oh, 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 from, oh, from that. Uh, <coughs> I suppose yeah, that you... Right, right, right. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. And that's a, that's. I'll just. I'm gonna take that as a to do. I'm gonna start comparing the two. See how they. See how they do. Um, okay, let's switch back over here. Okay. Honestly, the hardest part is always the AV stuff. Um, okay. Any other questions so far? Okay. Yes. It will be. It will be. So the altimeter one and altimeter two had the male USB coming out. That was kind of problematic. I mean, it's probably my own fault, but I, I made it as small as possible to make the unit as small as possible. And as soon, the first ones that really broke it were the MacBook Pros uh, a year or two ago. The case stood out, the port was indented, and it wouldn't quite fit. So a lot of people had to get cables or put it in their printer or whatever. It's kind of kludgy. And so now what will happen is that they'll all ship with a little cable like this, which will fit in anything. It'll fit anywhere. And you can get a longer one if you want. The other cool thing is that it's, it's micro. Uh, it's USB micro B. So if you've got a Bluetooth headset, your charger works with it. Um, lots of, it, it's kind of the standard for little teeny things that need recharging. So if you want to go to Radio Shack and you know, get, a, get a recharger, a car charger, anything, it would, it would work with this. Does it still have the accelerometers in there? In the three? It does. It has the three axis 24G accelerometer. We'll talk about sensors in, in a little bit. Uh, it still has a real good pressure sensor, the Bosch pressure sensor. Uh, on the G's, can you still do the trick that tells it to get around the 40s for the higher Yes, factor? yes you can. Right. And, and, and I once again did not put it at 45 degrees on the circuit board like I should have. Which would have, when you want, people want to line things up, right? It's just handier. I should have turned it 45 yeah. degrees on the circuit Even board. on a high power flight where I've got other people's electronics on it, I've got your Jolly Logic 2 and I always put it along for a ride. And it, it just rails and out. I, you know, I put it on oh. and then put it at the angle to get the higher G's Brilliant. Degree. Brilliant. Yeah, did you guys catch that? So, so uh, an accelerometer, you know, has orthogonal axes that it's measuring the acceleration of, and uh, they peg out at 24 g, and you include gravity in one of those, one of those directions, depending on which one we're going. But you have 24 g's. But if you turn it at a 45 degree angle every way, then you can, it'll go up to 41 because none of them get to 24, and the 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 hypotenuse is 41 G's tall. So a clever turning of it means that none of them peg out before it gets to 40 G's. That's, I mean, it's awkward angle. It's weird to put something like that. But OK, so we talked about mobile platforms a little bit. Here's, here's kind of what's important, what's not important. Worldwide shipments, you guys know Android is just dominating worldwide shipments. Android's in lots of, lots of phones that are less expensive. And, so, and then there's lots more options. Um, now, worldwide ownership's a little different. Apple kind of got a little bit of a head start. So there's actually a few more people that own Apple phones, if you just look at what's out there, not what's selling this year. The U.S. is different because that's iPhone's best market, is the U.S. They do better in the U.S. than they do in any other country. Well, maybe there's some small ones they do better in. But, but uh, so the U.S. ownership is a little more even. It's a little more what's like in this room. And when I did a, a, a survey on Rocketry Forum, I actually found out that Apple's got a little bit of an advantage in rocketry. So it kind of depends on who you care about. We care about, right here, US rocketry mostly. 
there are international competitions and things we go to. But, but that, that, so this is kind of like the zeroing in, and that's why a lot of our efforts been to make sure that we didn't want to ignore the Apple part, right? It's much easier to do Android development. It's much more open. Um, but we wanted to make sure we got these two, and we will get to Windows eventually. <laughs> <laughs> we will get there. Um, I, I do use a development environment which lets us do all three, so that's, that's, that's cool. Okay, so uh, Apple is really easy to use, right, when you get something, but it's hard to build for. Um, and this past Monday, the hardware got approved by Apple, so it made it through its lengthy process, and you should know that we started in 2012. Ouch. Yeah, so <laughs> if, you th if you think to yourself, how hard could it be you take an accelerometer and a pressure sensor, you put a microprocessor on it, you put a flash disk in there, you know, you get a, US, get, get a Bluetooth, you hook it up to Apple, you write an app. Everybody writes apps, right? Well, it's, it can be really, can be, they're very particular and it's really hard. Um, but um, we are through. And I think that this is probably the first official MiFi accessory for rocketry. So now, you know, there'll be a rocketry product that's, that's in there. So we, we talked about these lists, but let's talk a little bit about deployment. So, so that's kind of monitoring. That's being able to know on the pad that your, your stuff's a go. So maybe the Bluetooth is worth it, right? We know it's working. Uh, what I do, so it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit fine if you notice this, Ryan, or not, but at like, I'm like this at launches. And I think people think I'm taking a picture, like, like, like I'm the only one that's ever built a rocket like this. So I gotta take some pictures, but really I'm sitting there waiting when it's my turn up and the rocket before me launches, I hit record. Um, just because I don't want dead space on the front of the recording, have to trim it. You know, I just wait till it's time to go and I hit record and it's going and say, okay, we're good and we take off. But I'm sitting here, it's just a weird new thing that you're sitting here like this. It's like I'm at a, one of my kids' recitals or something, right? <coughs> Uh, so, so deployment, this category here, let's talk about that a little bit. And so um, uh, this has been the test rocket for me. I have a couple of these. Uh, it's an Aerotech uh, strong arm. I've built a payload section. Uh, at, at times when I fly, there will be, you know, I don't know, five or six altimeters in the payload, plus a reference altimeter from a third party. I use a Raven. I think Adam's stuff's really good. Uh, and then I'll put... I had four recently tied onto the, with the parachute down below because that's another mode people use the products in. So I'll have, you know, 10, 11 altimeters flying on this. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, you know, it's a pretty good flyer, right, on an H like this, you know, get, gets up above a couple thousand feet. Um, so my issues here, as I mentioned, is, you know, losing this really <laughs> hurts. So <laughs> we were at this flight at Moffitt a couple weeks ago. And uh, we have a we have a thousand foot waiver, so it's really cool because you're on this really cool historic base with giant hangars, tons of concrete. You wouldn't think there'd be any way you could lose a rocket out there, right? Might have to walk a little bit. Um, and so I, uh, I I had just flown on a G40 to, as you know, 698 feet, no problem. I got another engine out of my kit, which was a G80, and I thought, G, same impulse, roughly the same altitude. And I also launched it straight up. A breeze came up. Everyone's like, oh, you, you busted that waiver. It went to about 1,247 feet. And I had this new fruity shoot that I was using on. It just floated. And it floated into a secure area of the base. Bar barbed wire fence, you know, flight activities in there, all kinds of stuff. Um, and so, you know, you know, I'm watching 11 altimeters during flight <laughs> testing, you know, float over into a, into a, into a base, knowing it's going to hit on concrete, knowing those, knowing, knowing those fins are going to hit. Um, so, you know, what could I have done instead? What, what, what could I have done? Well, uh, uh, if, if I'm going to keep it from breaking, I want to put a big chute on it, right? Uh, I could have modified it for dual deployment, right? Let's let the chute down lower. Let's don't, don't pop it up there and let it, let it float forever. Uh, purchased a tracker. Well, in this case, I knew where it was, so it wasn't that. That wasn't as that wasn't as hard. Uh, going out in farmland, and you can't find it. Uh, or crossed my fingers, which is which is kind of kind of what I did in this case. Um, but the problems are kind of all related, which is that if they didn't drift so much, they'd be easier to find. Um, 
and, and that's why you use dual deployment, right? You, the initial ejection just trans, transitions the airframe to recovery mode, and then you open up the chute when you get down low. But why dual deployment is not used is that explosives are required, and they're more complicated to build and fly, setting them up, making sure they're ready, and those kind of things. And I have little kids, and um, I'll, I'll probably be getting into this. And if you're already into it, you don't think it's a big deal, right? You just, it's, some, it's just what you deal with. But for, for me, and maybe for other people, it's a little bit of a, bit of a kind of a barrier. So one thing I w I'm working on is the ability to give almost any rocket dual deployment with conventional motor ejection. Uh, you decide when you want the chute to open. And instead of saying, I don't want this thing to drift, I better put a small chute on it. Oh, I think my fins are going to break. Um, go ahead and size the parachute for a soft landing, but be able to open it when you want to. And you know, maybe this will reduce, reduce uh, zippering if we can choose when we want to open it up. And then this is the product concept. Uh, this is a little device which would snap open at altitude. So you'd luff your chute or you'd put your chute in a bag and you'd just go ahead and inject it out on top and you'd set this for an altitude. So you'd say, I want this thing to open up at 400 feet. And as it came back to the ground, it would use the pressure sensor just like the other altimeters use and it would snap open the top and it would let your chute pull out. Okay? So instead of needing an ejection charge to get your chute out, what you would do is you would, you would luff your chute or you'd bag your chute you clip this on it and you'd say, here's the altitude I want this thing to open at. Makes sense? And it's got to be pretty small. There's a quarter there. It's got to be pretty small because you want to be able to fit it in lots of rockets. You don't want this thing to be a big, huge, heavy thing. You want this to be, you know, an, an, just an ounce or two uh, and make it rechargeable. What's interesting is um, when I first was developing this, see that little red tab on there? Can anybody guess what that red tab is? The altimeter? No. Core. It's a pull pin. It's a pull pin. Because one mode that people wanted was, was time. They wanted time from ejection. And so if you choose one of these time settings and you tie a string to that, when it ejects, and it'll pull that pin and it'll start counting. And then it'll let it go. And the idea there was that you, want, you don't want that boom of a chute opening, but you do want something that'll luff your chute for just a few seconds so that it doesn't rip open at high speeds. That's just a mode that people want. So I think, I think that'll stay in, but that gives you two options. You can either choose time or you can choose altitude. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, let me see, do I have... Uh, that's right, because you have to have transit, you somehow you have to transition your airframe to be able to let this thing work. That's right. We've got this. You've got you've got a really small servo. Oh, okay. And right now uh, there's a little custom horn being a little mold being created for it. Um, most servos most servos pull. The servo servo is going to have an eccentric cam on the end. It's actually going to push. And having a little custom cam created for that. So that's a little little teeny little servo that's in there. And so. You can imagine the servo that you're holding there takes up most of the space in here. It's about uh, it's, it's about this big in here, okay? And it uses the same battery that the uh, new A1, A2, and A3 use, <coughs> and it recharges. There's a little same micro USB charger on the side. Any idea on release dates on that wonderful device? This wonderful device. Uh, uh, I actually, I'm not sure this is going to be all that popular, to be honest. So, it takes me a week to set up a 24 mil rocket in, in dual deploy. Right, right, right. Yeah, with explosives, without really explosives, black powder, pyrodex, stuff like that. Now, this is 24. Really? The this thing? is revolutionary yeah. Yeah, because the other product that failed used burn wires and timing. Right, right, right. You've got a barometer in there. Well, it's funny because this is one of those, whenever you're designing products, you always have the products you really want to have for yourself. This is one I've always wanted to have, but I'm not sure anybody else wants. So. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. 
It's, it's about uh, an inch and a half wide. Yeah, I don't. Good, good point. I don't think we'll get this in 24. I, I could go in an AutoCAD and do the di you need to do the diagonal of the case. I don't think it's 24. Well, you guys are you volunteering to beta test. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I will say this: I'm trying to make it as small as I can, and 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 in what I do, a millimeter is a big, huge deal. So I try to get it out, but. You know, it, that servo, the, the mechanicals that are in there. I'd say the one thing that I, that I still have a question about, that I'm still kind of working on, I'll do it both ways and see, is that it'd be a lot cheaper if it wasn't aircraft aluminum, but the plan right now is that it's aircraft aluminum. That's for strength. That's for strength. Because you get, you get shock loads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And shock loads are tough. Shock loads are tough. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the nice thing here is the failure mode is not catastrophic. It's just the chute opens early. Right, so that's not a bad, the bad failure mode is, you know. Could it fail closed? Core sample is the bad. Uh, could it fail closed? Uh, it has to have power to open. Yeah. Right. It has to have power to open. So a, a, a connector coming off, a battery dying, uh, you know, those kind of things. Um, when, you, when, you, when you turn it on, you'll see a row of green lights that tell you what the battery level is. So you'll have a pretty, pretty good idea of, of battery level. Not planning to put Bluetooth on this. That's probably like, yeah. I probably shouldn't say that. Not planning to put Bluetooth in it. Try to keep it cheap. Try to keep it small. Keep the power down. The idea is this is kind of a box product where when it's off, it's off. And Stop you selling and building. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry. 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 Okay. So moving along. Moving along. Uh, tracking. Rockets that drift away forever. We better hurry. Okay. Um, uh, there are directional trackers and GPS trackers. Who here uses a tracker pretty routinely? That's, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, they're costly, they're sometimes bulky, they have range limitations, and they can be complicated. Uh, everybody wants a tracker, not everybody gets a tracker. Here's the trade-offs a guy like me has to face, is that what you really want is a ham license, because they work much better, they have much longer ranges, they use much less power. Part of the reason is there's less restrictions on the people that make a ham module they can uh, transmit more frequently, they can put more power, they can do all kinds of things. Um, but it's kind of, a, there's e easy trade-offs, right? Little teeny module, about the size of your pinky fingernail, uh, really low range, low power, all the way up to really hefty ones that people like to use that have extended ranges and need a battery you know, about the size of a cell phone. They use a couple amps of power, okay? And then the ultimate, like, you put, why not put a cell phone in it, right? That's a network that's pretty, pretty wide. Well, that is a big battery, they are pretty power hoggy, and you're going to have to have a subscription to a cell phone plan, which is not a consumer friendly thing to do. Okay? Different approaches needed. So here's what, I'll, here's what I'll suggest for this. Okay? The one way, the way we do it now is every man for himself. Okay? You bring your own equipment, you better have some good equipment because you're on your own, and uh, you, we have to get together and say, do we, uh, what frequency are you using? Oh, I'm on that too. You know. Uh, not that people do that, usually you'll find the other guy's rocket and then you'll say, well, he's obviously on my frequency. <laughs> a new way, let's network. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm suggesting, a new, a new casual field network that we, we can set up. Peer-to-peer, -peer, ad hoc, nothing to set up. You show up with your equipment and it works. Uh, it's collaborative, so all the nodes help each other. And it's additive, so your node and my node help each other on range. And the nodes have memory. So if you're, I'm being a little vague here, but I'll explain this. If you run across my rocket when you're out in the field and you come back when we're in range with each other, yours will tell mine that where my rocket is. Okay? Here's how it kind of work. Okay, California test number two. What's that? That's Snow Ranch. That is Snow Ranch, where, where, uh, where we do our high power launches. Uh, so here's, here's our nets, right? We've all got rockets on the ground. They actually don't have very good range. Let's say it's a quarter mile range, something like that, okay? But the way that this would work is that all these nets would talk to each other. This one talks to this one, talks to this one. So all these people see their rockets, even though their own range is relatively small because they all talk to each other and they pass the messages along. What about this guy? Yeah. Th this is mine. This is my one that went sideways. <laughs> He's not connected. I'm back there with all the people, right? And, and, and it's not connected. Well, what happens? Well, every flight that goes up becomes a satellite, right? Uh, so that one connects it, right? Or, 
or if I walk out to find mine, I've walked past maybe some other ones. And when I come back, we reconnect and the information gets shared. And you might say to yourself, well, okay, but that sounds like an excuse just to make a little crappy low range product. Um, there, there are a lot of really good benefits to this. One is that the nodes can be much smaller. I'm talking about a matchbox size tracker. Okay, and they'll fit more places. The more places they fit, the more people will use them. They'll cost a lot less. The battery's smaller, everything's smaller. They're more affordable, more of us will have them, the more the merrier. Because we have better coverage, right? People can help each other. And you'll always have the option to build your own net. Why not go out there at Snow Ranch and place a few? Set the place up to start with. If you're talking matchbox size, why not just have one guy with a quad rotor? And he just zips around. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Why are you not? Now you know what Okay. He's cheap. He's cheap. Uh, yeah, so, so that maybe there is a use for drones, right? Not just Amazon d dropping books down your chimney, but uh, you can literally program them for waypoints and say, do a search pass. Go, it'll actually go out of radi radio range, run its path, and come back to you. Okay, so have, have your 14-year-old kid bring their drone, do a little service. Hey, did you drop out of range? You know, which direction was it? Let me go there. What I'd like to do is work with a drone company to say, to, have, to, to get drone support for a flight where the second it takes off, the drone takes off towards it by feeding the information and just goes out in a search pattern and, and finds it wherever it goes and comes back. Maybe a 10 minute time limit, something like that. Or when the rocket stops, it comes back and says, here's where it is. Even though the tracker I've got on my rocket has a half mile range, let's say. All you've got to do is get close to it at some point and you'll find it. Another, another alternative for people that won't, don't want to buy a drone and this is one of those Z or meshes that are out there in design is could you just pre-plant Eltoid box nodes out in what your expected area Yep, you can put a little solar cell up, put a little box. And they're so yeah. cheap, you can just set them all up on the ranch and then pick them back. That's right. And so the product designer, my job is to say, hey, how do you set up a net like that? You, you don't. You just put it out there. If it's turned on, it's on. Right? That's how it works. Okay, so that's my vision of this. And that's that's kind of what I want to have happen on this. Um, and I think that we're, are we out of time right now? Let me. Uh, How does it report the location? Is it just a GPS coordinate or, or does it go to Google? What? You're sitting here, here's where it is, right? And, and I think what the interesting thing would be is, is, is you, you really know that, uh, that this is working correctly when the blue dot's way away from it. And you know you don't have five miles range, but it appears. <laughs> Almost by magic. You're sitting there thinking you've lost it. Someone comes back in their truck, pulls up to the launch, and all of a sudden, bingo, the, the data comes across, and bam, it says, I found you. And it's because the nets all cooperate. You guys are using <laughs> but I guess, I guess what I want you to think about here is, is, and I fell into this trap too, is tracking means big range. Big range means big antenna, means big battery, means if it goes behind a barn, I'm screwed. Right? If they could really be teeny, and we really had more of them, and they were really easy to set up and use, maybe suddenly it becomes pretty darn useful. And maybe even if, even if I'm the only guy to launch, but it's a cornfield or something, a plowed field, right? Just I'll take a quarter mile. You know, I'll take I'll take I'll take a hundred feet, right? You know that kind of thing. So. That's right. Float a, float, a, float a satellite. Float a satellite above the launch. And remember, the last good data you can get helps, too. Uh, the hardware stuff, I was going to show you some things. If you want to come up and see what sensors look like, they'll all fit on a quarter. They're teeny. They're cheap now. And they're even consolidating down into one cheap chip. Um, what was a, you know, a three-axis accelerometer and a gyroscope are now being put on one chip, which is teensy tiny. Um, not always at the G levels we need, you know, so this hasn't happened for us yet, 24G. There will probably be an extreme version of the altimeter 2 and 3 that goes up to 400G. It will probably set it at 200 or 100. I mean, it's kind of maybe make, make that setting maybe. You get less sensitivity when you go to 400, but if you're 
line, you know, hammer, you need, you need to amp it up. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so there's different ideas about what you can start to fuse together to do things. You know, gyros for air starts if it tips. This is already being done a little bit too, by the way. You can always see some telemetrum products and some other products that'll, that'll do things like this. You know, if it tilts too much, um, don't use it. We don't have a ton of use for gyros in rockets uh, because we don't do guidance and um, they don't work well over time. You can't go to the mar you can't, can't go to the moon with one of our chip gyros. They drift too much. But something like this, where it's a relatively you know, you know you start like this. If it tilts past here, don't fire. That could be done. You know, GPS on drift. Um, you can imagine a product like, like shoot release that uh, varies its altitude based on GPS. You know, if, if, if it's not drifting, and I'll go ahead and open and just bring it down soft. If it's really drifting hard, wait longer. You can imagine different things. Um, one of the things I'm working, um, uh, I don't know if you, any of you guys um, saw an article in Apogee's newsletter, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago about temperature correction mm -hmm. and errors in altimeters. What we're working with, Norm, who wrote that article, Norm and I, are working on being able to do web lookups and things to grab temperature and humidity from the nearest weather underground station and be able to do weather correction. We can already do pressure correction, as I mentioned, from elevation. Um, but be able to automatically provide a corrected altimeter view if you want to use it based on the current weather. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. Um, there's new versions of the Altimeter 2 coming out. The reason is that they have bigger batteries, they have replaceable parts, they have graphical screens that scroll, that do all kinds of nice things like that, and the parts are now replaceable so that you can put your own new screen in put your own new battery in. You could already change the case. Cool. I ran over, I'm sorry, but thank you. Uh, and I have, I have cards up here if you want, if you have ideas or things you want to talk to me about. Uh, I love collaborating on, on products with people. Um, Working with uh, one of my collaborators on uh, shoot release is uh, Gene Engelgal, who's Fruity Shoots, uh, who has a lot of exposure to how different people do deployment. So it's important for a product like that. But thank you very much.